In this video, we're going to look at the four general properties of the transition elements. We'll start with variable oxidation state. So I've got four compounds of sodium on the board there. So we've got sodium chloride, sodium oxide, sodium hydroxide, and sodium carbonate. Sodium has a plus one oxidation state in all of its compounds. So is that variable? No, it's not. It's fixed. And you can see I've added some compounds of iron just to show um, the difference between a non-transition element and a transition element. And you can see I've done the chloride, the oxide, the hydroxide and the carbonate. And what you can see in all of these compounds of iron, that the iron is in the plus two oxidation state in all of these compounds. So this will be called iron two chloride and we'd use the Roman numeral for the oxidation number. Iron two oxide, iron two hydroxide and iron two carbonate. In all of these compounds, iron's in the plus three oxidation state so that's iron 3 chloride with that Roman 3. Iron 3 oxide, iron 3 hydroxide, and iron 3 carbonate. The reason for that is written at the bottom there. You've got the 4S and 3D energy levels that are very, very close in energy. Remember when these. Um, transition elements form these ions, plus two and plus three, they lose the 4s electrons first, then the 3d electrons are lost. But because these are so close in energy, it's quite easy for them to lose different numbers of electrons. Whereas for sodium, that's not the case. Once that outer electron's gone, um, for sodium, the ionization energy is too high for sodium to lose another electron and so it has a fixed oxidation state of plus one but the transition elements can vary. The second of these properties is the transition elements can form complex ions so just a statement there for you in solution transition elements form complex ions so what are complex ions well they're described as having a central transition metal ion which is surrounded by something called ligands. So what's a ligand? A ligand is a molecule or an ion that forms a dative covalent or coordinate bond with that central transition metal ion. So I've got this very simple diagram on the board to try and explain how one example of a complex ion forms. I've chosen something that you'll hopefully be familiar with, copper sulfate, so that's a blue solid and imagine you put some copper sulfate solid into a beaker and add some water. Now obviously you'd end up with a blue solution of aqueous copper sulfate. So what we're going to do is have a look at what's actually happened to the copper ion in the copper sulfate. Now what's actually happened is this copper 2 plus ion has been surrounded by these six water molecules and we hopefully know that oxygen on a water molecule has two lone pairs. I've shown one there. So if we look at this lower one here, so the, the lone pair on the oxygen has kind of donated this pair of electrons and formed a date of covalent bond with the copper two plus ion. So this is the ligand, and obviously this is the central transition metal ion. So a complex ion is a central transition metal ion surrounded by ligands. So this is known as the hexa aqua copper 2 plus ion. So hexa means 6, aqua means water, and obviously copper is in the 2 plus oxidation state. And the formula of this complex ion is written like this. So we have square brackets, obviously because it's an ion. Copper, 6 water, ligands, and if you think about the charge, the overall charge of the ion, well, water is a neutrally charged molecule, 
So the two plus is coming from the two plus um, copper. The third of the transition metal properties are the fact that they form coloured compounds. I've got three examples here for you. So this ties in nicely with what we've just been discussing about complex ions. So this is a solution of copper 2 sulphate. But remember the copper 2 ions are actually in the hexa aqua form because the water ligand has formed a complex ion. So copper 2 sulphate is blue. The second example I've got is nickel 2 sulphate. You see this is a nice green colour. And again, it doesn't matter that that's sulphate there. The important thing to remember is this is um, got the nickel hexa aqua 2 plus ion in there. So again, in this one, you've got nickel in the middle. You've got nickel 2 plus ion in the middle surrounded by six water ligands. And the final example is cobalt to chloride and this is pink and again we've got water ligands surrounding the central cobalt 2 plus ion. So again it doesn't matter that that's a chloride. Um, the important thing is we've got cobalt 2 in water so we've got that hexa aqua 2 plus ion in there. So the first picture here, I want you to imagine the transition element without a ligand attached. So you can see these 3D orbitals, there's five of them, they've got a certain amount of energy. When the ligand attaches, what that does is it raises the energy of the 3D um, electrons. And that's basically because the electrons in the ligands are repelling the electrons in the um, in the 3D orbitals. Now you can see I've changed the diagram slightly. So instead of having all the orbitals at the same higher energy, I've got two at, a, uh, at the highest energy and then three at still higher than before, but lower energy than those two. And this is what happens when octahedral complexes form. So if we look at copper 2 sulphate, for example, so that's the copper 2 plus um, hexa aqua ion. Copper 2 plus has a 3D9 configuration, so I've put the electrons in here. And because we've got this difference in energy between the, the sort of upper 2 3D orbitals and the lower 3 3D orbitals, this can actually now absorb energy and an electron could be promoted, provided it absorbs the right amount of energy, it can be promoted from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. So because we've got this energy gap, this can now absorb energy. So if you appreciate that white light is a source of energy, we've got this energy gap between these two higher and lower energy levels, we can absorb a certain pocket of energy which corresponds to this energy gap here. And that's all linked by an equation that you study in physics, uh, which is E equals HF. So the energy, the delta E, this energy gap here, if you divide that by Planck's constant, you get the frequency of white light that's going to be absorbed. So copper sulfate is blue because it's absorbing a certain amount of energy from white light. It's actually absorbing the red part of the um, visible spectrum and we see what's left of the, um, the colours um, and the complementary colour, that's what it's called, the complementary colour to, to red is pale blue. Now, some of you might be pleased to know that that's not on the syllabus anymore. The important thing to appreciate is transition elements have coloured compounds because of this energy gap, and therefore, because there's an energy gap, they can absorb a certain amount of energy. Electron will be promoted from a lower to a higher energy state, and we see 
the complementary colour the remainder of the visible light if you like. Uh, some transition metal compounds are actually colourless. For example copper 1 iodide CuI. So why could that be? Well copper 1 iodide contains the copper 1 plus ion. There's the electronic configuration of the ion. So we've lost that 4s1 electron to give us this 1 plus charge. So we've got an electronic configuration of argon 3d10. So the ligand's attached. We've got this delta E, this splitting. We've got a change in energy. But you can see that these 3d orbitals are all full. So there's nowhere for an electron to be promoted to. So it doesn't absorb any part of, of white light. So the whole, the whole component, all the components of white light travel through and so we see the result of that which is obviously white light again so uh, their compounds are colourless as a result. So the fourth and final of these general properties of the transition elements is their ability to act as catalysts. We're going to start with the type of catalysis known as heterogeneous catalysis and that's when the catalyst is in a different phase or physical state to the reactants. So the example I'm going to use is the catalytic converter. Now that has a solid catalyst made of platinum, palladium and rhodium. And the reactants are these two gases, the nitrogen monoxide and the carbon monoxide. So what does the catalyst do? The solid catalyst provides this surface for adsorption to occur on. So these little dotted lines here represent the NO and CO molecules adsorbing with the surface of the catalyst. It's bringing these closer together. It's weakening the bonds inside the molecules and therefore making it easier to react, i.e. lowering the activation energy. So adsorption occurs first. Then we have the reaction taking place between the two uh, molecules. And the final thing to happen is the nitrogen that's formed and the carbon dioxide that's formed has to leave the surface and that's called desorption. The other type of catalysis that transition metals can perform is known as homogeneous catalysis. And you can see I've written up there, that's when the catalyst and the reactants are in the same phase or the same physical state. And the example I'm going to use is the reaction between aqueous uh, these are called peroxidisulfate ions and aqueous iodide ions. Now this reaction can either be catalysed by aqueous iron 2 plus ions or aqueous iron 3 plus ions. There's the overall equation for the reaction and you can hopefully appreciate why this would have a high activation energy. It's not going to occur very readily because we have two negatively charged ions trying to react with each other. Now we've already said that this reaction can be catalyzed by either of these two ions. So I've got some iron 2 plus ions here. Uh, if we introduce iron 2 plus ions to this reaction, what it can do is react with the peroxidized sulfate ions and we've got the sulfate ion made there and the iron 2 is oxidized to iron 3. The iron 3 plus ions that are then formed feed into the second equation whereby they react with the iodide ions and convert the iodide ions into iodine and this regenerates the iron 2 plus ion. So you can see if you combine those two equations we can cancel out the ions of iron and we're left with the overall equation S2O8 2 minus plus 2I minus gives SO4 2 minus and I2. Now there's nothing to say that this reaction um, can't happen first so if you introduced iron 3 plus to this instead the second equation would happen first we generate the iron 2 plus ions they would then feed in and allow this step to happen. So these steps can happen in either order.